There is, in Nova Scotia, handed down through the generations of her family, a remarkable diary, a daily journal kept by a First World War nurse named Claire Gass. On October 30th, 1915, she copied down a 15-line poem written by one of the doctors in her hospital. Claire Gass made a little bit of history that day, for this is the earliest written record of the poem's existence. Of all the words of war ever written, it is these simple, remarkable words which have become the most quoted, the most remembered, and for many, the most moving. Less than a hundred words that linger forever over the graves of the long dead boys hover in remembrance over their short-lived lives. Inspired by the bombing death of a young officer, the words were captured and shaped by an exhausted Canadian named John McRae. Words fused together in a foreign land, in a foreign and long ago time, in Flanders Fields. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow, between the crosses row on row that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from failing hands we throw the torch, be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Flanders Field is a poem that every mother, every father who had lost a son in that war could apply to their son. Many of the other poems could only be applied to the author. They're in fact poems about the author. And McRae's medical background, I often think, comes out in that poem. There is a man who's used to seeing other people suffering. And some of the very best war poetry was written by people for whom suffering was not a shock or a surprise. Uh, McRae, I think, fits very firmly into that category. He's writing a poem for all the young men that he'd seen through his dressing stations. He's not writing it for himself. Never in the history of the world had there been a war like this. In mere moments, centuries of humanity and culture would be targeted and obliterated. Ancient towns would be blown out of existence, an entire generation devastated. Every human soul involved in this tragedy would leave some personal imprint of their time here. Some would make their mark just by surviving. Others would leave inconsolable families or alter forever the lives of orphaned sons and daughters, leaving a generation of adult grandchildren to search for memories in a gallery of foreign graveyards. In all, 20 million people would die here, each of them leaving something. John McRae would leave a poem, a poem which would be memorized and recited by soldiers in the trenches and handed down as part of our ceremony of remembrance. But while the poem would stay with us, the life of the man who wrote it, like millions of other lives lost here, would eventually slip from our memory 
become just another shadow in a mostly forgotten war. We'd forget the details of his life. John McRae was born in middle-class Guelph, Ontario in 1872. The second son in a family of three. His mother was a daughter of a Scots Presbyterian minister. His father, a farmer and mill owner who was known in the town as the man who founded the local militia unit. Although both he and his older brother Tom would be trained as doctors, John McRae was brought up as a soldier. The best drilled cadet in Ontario in 1887, age 15. As was the custom, the Presbyterian McCrae's went to church at least once every Sunday. And when he got to the University of Toronto, where the raging debate was whether mankind had been placed on earth by God, or if the upstart Charles Darwin was right about his new theory of evolution, John McCrae came down firmly on the side of God. It was while he was a student here that John McCrae fell in love for the first and what would appear to be the only time. Her name was also McRae, Alice McRae. No relation, and according to all sources, very beautiful. She was his first girlfriend. I mean, he obviously was deeply in love with her. She was probably 18, he was probably about 21, and so on. And then she, she died in, in the days when people did suddenly die of infection. So here we have a, a, a wonderful girl, a sort of budding relationship, and then suddenly it snapped out. She died of typhoid, she was only 19, and they, they had become quite close friends, I think. Obviously, he'd met her um, through, his, uh, through his friend and her brother. Um, and it appears that he was very profoundly affected by her death. It was a shock, and it upset him greatly. No picture or photograph remains of young Alice McRae. All we have is John's entry in his diary following her funeral. So this is where her grave will be. Through the long nights when the cold winds wake the grey-eyed morn, and when the sunless afternoons are deepening into the cheerless dark, when the summer rain drips from the trees and the cold winter breaths sigh through the bare branches. And I, I wonder sometimes whether that the experience with Alice and her sudden death maybe made him a little bit uncertain with, with women. It certainly, um, it was a very hard burden for him to, to face at that, that age. John McRae would never marry. He eventually graduated with a medical degree and got a job in the newly created pathology department at McGill University in Montreal. But within a year, he was packing to leave. War had broken out in South Africa in 1899, and John McRae wanted to be part of it. But he would go not as a doctor, he would go as a soldier. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, and if one asks oneself the question why, I think it has to be because he had been in the militia since he was a teenager. He'd been commissioned as a lieutenant in the um, militia um, back in 1893. And I think his sense of adventure and perhaps his desire to find out what real soldiering was all about um, was, I think, drove him to want to, to want to perhaps set medicine aside and go off and find out and, and go and, and fight as a soldier rather than be there as a medical officer. 242 Canadians would die in the Boer War, but John McRae survived and came back to Montreal late in 1900. This was the golden age of medicine, and by the end of the first decade of the century, John McRae was highly regarded as both a doctor with a private practice and as a teacher of pathology at McGill's University Hospital. He contributed to the most learned medical textbooks of his time, and his autopsy records, written in his own hand, are still kept in the famous Osler Library. He was also accepted by the Canadian literati as a poet of some promise. John McRae was a popular bachelor doctor, much sought after by the hostesses along Montreal's Golden Mile, where the richest people in Canada competed with each other for holding the biggest parties in the biggest houses. <laughs>
It was the, the Golden Mile Society at its most golden, with great dinners and lavish banquets and receptions, theater parties, everything that they could think of to match the, 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 the glitter of London society or New York society. And in that, that world, uh, John McRae, the handsome, uh, articulate, uh, veteran doctor with, who could in full dress appear with his South African war medals. What an attraction for a hostess who needed a, an eligible man to sit next to Auntie Sophie or, or to Mrs. Uh, McGillicuddy, whose husband had died. He is an asset of, of unmeasurable quality in that society. In the summer of 1914, John McRae was sailing to England on vacation so he wasn't in London on August the 4th when the crowd celebrated the declaration of war by throwing their hats in the air and destroying local German-owned businesses. Neither was he in Munich a couple of days earlier when captured in the crowd, anxious to hear news of the impending war, would be a young man named Adolf Hitler. In Canada, with a population of only 8 million, nearly half a million men would end up in uniform. John McRae would be one of them, although at 42, he was much older than the average volunteer. He believed this was a, a just cause and an important one. And because of his activity in the reserves, how would he have felt if other people went and he didn't go in the, the biggest war his lifetime would ever see? And what man of 42 really tells his friends that I'm past it? In fact, the 40s are the time when you really want to prove that you still can do it as a man. I'm sure he thought it would be a tremendous adventure. And remember, he and most others believed that they would be home in a matter of months. Almost everyone in the civilized world believed the war would be over by Christmas. Almost everyone was wrong. The Canadian troops arrived in England in October 1914. 30,000 officers and men and 7,000 horses. John McRae had been given the rank of major and a horse named Bonfire. He was to be assigned as senior medical officer, but he was also to be second in command of the 1st Brigade Canadian Field Artillery. The Canadians had spent their summer going through preliminary training in Valcartier, Quebec, and were convinced that they were ready for action. But the British High Command didn't share their view and moved them instead into a tent city on the Salisbury Plains, where they devised special exercises to bring them up to the British standard. The troops soon settled in and reported to Major McRae that it was just like camping. Then, of course, the English winter descended a wetter than average, warmer than average winter on the whole. And uh, the tents were soon sodden and so were their contents and so were the men inside them. It was a pretty good preparation for what trench warfare would be like. In fact, some of the Valcartier, uh, some of the Salisbury Plain survivors said it was worse than the trenches would ever be. Certainly it was wet and cold and miserable as an English winter can be. And in the middle of it, here is a brigade, a, a division of amateurs trying to get trained, trying to learn how to use their weapons, how to do tactics, how to survive in, in bad conditions. Now, I think the British were very suspicious of colonial troops. They, somebody described the Canadian 1st Division or, or Expeditionary Force as a, a mob of farmers on a bunch of green horses, which is typical sort of British arrogance. I mean, you couldn't get more arrogant than that. And even when they went to France for the first time, um, once they got there, General Haig told them to pretend to be British because he said, look, if the, if the Germans know you're Canadians, they're just going to walk all over you. Life in the tents was miserable. Many of the horses brought from Canada had to be shot after standing too long in the mud. The Canadian-made boots leaked and the heavy greatcoats couldn't dry. The kilts would cake with mud and cut the backs of their legs as they marched. The rifles they were issued jammed and were difficult to operate. To make matters even worse, Colonel Sam Hughes, Canada's Minister of Defense, had insisted that no alcohol be permitted in the camp, not even beer. 
Sam Hughes, like a lot of Ontario Protestants of his day, was in fact cold, sober temperance. You may think some of his behavior could only be explained by booze, but no, he was dry. Uh, he had to do it on his own. He also understood that most of the women of Canada, at least of his acquaintance, were dry too, and they wouldn't have let their boy join the army if they thought he was going to become a boozer. After all, it was a serious problem at the time. So this was a cold water army, so far as Sam could make it so. And doing that in Britain, as you can testify, ain't easy. The situation did improve once the sale of beer was approved in camp, but these two particular um, soldiers had been out probably celebrating Christmas just coming up and so on, came back, had caused a ruckus in the local town and had been um, put in jankers for Christmas Day. And so the story goes, John McRae, as their medical officer, um, had a, a probably sort of thought, ah, oh, well, they've learnt their lesson, but we can't have these two, you know, not having some sort of Christmas cheer. So as the story goes, he sent each of them a small um, brown bottle labelled, you know, to be taken with meals, and it turned out it was an issue of um, rum, which he was able to do at his discretion, <laughs> which I thought was rather a nice touch for Christmas. <laughs> The Canadian medical staff soon discovered that their troops were finding more than the occasional hangover on their trips into the local and beautiful countryside. Of the 4,000 Canadian hospital visits on the Salisbury Plains over the winter of 1914 and 15, nearly 2,000 of them would be for treatment of venereal disease. Whether they had brought it in with them or had caught it in these picturesque English villages was a matter of constant debate. Well, there's an argument, of course, uh, across the Atlantic. Where did these lads take some over with them, or was it entirely acquired in Great Britain? And Canadian nationalists have been arguing that one ever since. Canadian women were all pure, or no Canadian women had their fair share. Uh, and certainly Canadian men had whatever old Adam it took. Uh, Canadians would, throughout the war, among other things, not perhaps the most important event of the war, acquire a championship in venereal disease rate. Even the Australians couldn't match us. Modern day troops still train where the Canadians suffered through the wettest and most miserable winter in memory. The Salisbury Plains, early in 1915, had been turned into a mud bath, and Ottawa demanded that their troops be moved out of the leaking tents and into the wooden huts the British had originally promised. When the huts were built, they had little, if any, ventilation and became an instant breeding ground for disease. Suddenly, John McRae had an epidemic on his hands as 39 boys came down with meningitis. 28 of them died, the first major Canadian casualties of the war effort. In the small and pretty English town of Devizes, the local Bear Hotel became the Canadian officers' mess and headquarters while they waited to go to the front. And it was here that McRae and the other officers would learn of the carnage, which became known as the First Battle of Ypres. First Battle of Ypres had been the death of the British regular army. And that had made the soil of Ypres sacred to British generals, many of whom had lost their own son at that battle. So Ypres was very valuable territory emotionally to the British High Command and to many senior British officers. It was also the last corner of free Belgium. Oddly enough, it was populated by people who were not very fond of the Belgian regime. They were Belgian Flemish. But nonetheless, to the Allies, it was important to keep a corner of Belgium. To the British generals who'd lost their sons, it was important to keep that sacred soil from the Germans. So it's symbolic ground. They were finally moved out in March 1915 and assigned to that symbolic ground near the town of Ypres. On April 20th, a group of local children had been playing in the market square while their parents debated whether they should move further behind the Allied lines. Without warning, a German shell exploded and killed 15 of the children. The Second Battle of Ypres had begun. German prisoners of war had confessed that canisters of poison gas had been stockpiled near the front lines. The evidence was irrefutable. But amazingly, the information was dismissed. The British High Command simply refused to believe such barbarism was possible. There were signs that a gas attack was being prepared, but who would believe them? 
The Germans, after all, might be denounced in propaganda as hideous, fiendish Huns, but in reality they were a civilized European army that had promised not to do this. So let's not take these excitable accounts too seriously. If you believed all the excitable accounts generals got, they wouldn't have done anything. And this was just one more rumor. When the Germans opened up more than 5,000 canisters of chlorine gas. They'd waited for conditions to be right, which they were, late afternoon on the 22nd of April, 1915. The gas um, had been pumped in under force, so it spurted out with quite a force. It was carried on the breeze once it had sort of reached about 1,000 yards, 100 yards from where the canisters were and started to drift towards the Allied lines. It affected the French troops um, first and, and probably worst of all, although the Canadians were also badly affected. But um, it was such a shock and it was so awful, um, the suffering and the shock, that the line broke. And um, the Canadians found themselves in a terrible position. What happened next? The Germans themselves are astonished. They never imagined it would be that easy. They were accustomed to the kinds of hard, slogging, merciless, hugely expensive attacks on the Western Front. Suddenly, the enemy had vanished. It must be a trick. Stop, wait, uh, let's see what's gonna happen next. Which was the salvation of the Canadians, because if the Germans had really been planning a major success, they would have swept around the Canadians and, and 20,000 Canadians would have found themselves rapidly dead or prisoners of war. The end result of all this was by the time um, the um, division was withdrawn um, of a division of 20,000 men, more than 6,000 had been killed, wounded or posted missing. Um, and this, you know, this was a, a terrible shock for, um, for the Dominion. It was a very terrible battle um, and the first, of course, the first gas attack in the history of warfare. Fortunately, the Canadians had some expertise. A small unit had been formed uh, for chemical analysis, basically to protect the water supply. But the, the chemist involved, Colonel Naismith, who was a University of Toronto professor, uh, knew a lot about chemistry and knew a lot about chemical medical problems. And he was the one who seems to have given the advice that if the soldiers will urinate into a piece of their handkerchief or maybe a, a bandage of some kind, hold it over their nose, the, the urine will be some protection against chlorine. It, whether or not it was, and it, it's, it's some use against it. Chemically, it was good use morally. At least you had something you could do. Maybe pretty nauseous if you think about it, but at least this was something you could do rather than just stand there and wait for it. As John McRae said, he, he himself um, described it as 17 days of Hades. Um, the medical officers said it was like a, a nightmare, like working the seventh hell of the damned. It, it's just, it's impossible to imagine what it must have been like. For 17 days and 17 nights, none of us have had our clothes off, except occasionally for a change of socks. In all that time, while I was awake, gunfire and rifle fire never ceased for 60 seconds. Our casualties are half the men on the firing line. My clothes, boots, kit and dugout at various times were sadly bloody. There is the constant background of the sight of the dead, the wounded, the maimed. None of our men went off their heads, but men in nearby units did, and no wonder. How tired we are, weary in body, and wearier in mind. And all the time, the birds sing over our heads. McRae's involvement is with a field ambulance, which is partly collecting wounded and partly giving them their first treatment as casualties. And frankly, uh, he is engaged mainly with uh, traditional casualties, the, the, the wounded, from shell fire and from bullets. And shell fire wounds greatly outnumber bullet wounds and they are terrible. Nobody can be prepared for them in medical school. I mean, a shell wound is simply a piece of white hot metal that hits your body somewhere. And it will kill you very often or it'll tear off great hunks of flesh, leaving bones exposed. I mean, I don't want to get it too graphic, but realize that's what the medical corps is basically there trying to cope with. And, really appalling wounds, disgusting, the sort of thing that would keep a, a modern day emergency ward fully engaged on one case. And here they're coming in uh, twos, tens, dozens, fifties. 
Every day on the Western Front, 7,000 British troops were killed or wounded. It's unbelievable numbers there. And that, and that was just on a normal day. That was nothing to do with a major battle. The fields of Flanders had been heavily manured for centuries, and when the men fell with open wounds into the soil, the bacteria there would cause terrible infections. Amputation seemed the only solution. Still standing near the town of Ypres are the bunkers that once served as his makeshift field hospital. And it was here, as the battle raged, that John McRae was about to write the poem which would capture, for all time, the terrible essence of the war in Flanders. At the Bear Hotel in Devizes, just before being moved to the front, the Canadian officers of the 1st Field Artillery had posed for their official photograph. McRae was on the left. In the middle, in the top row, stood 22-year-old Lieutenant Alexis Helmer. Helmer had been a student at McGill while McRae taught there, and had also been raised in the tradition of the Canadian militia. John McRae and the young officer had a lot in common. They did move in the same social circles, same strata of society. But Helmer, I think, would very much have looked up to Dr. McRae, as he would have thought of him, or Professor McRae, and would have felt that he was definitely being singled out and flattered by uh, becoming closer, becoming friendly with John McRae. Lex Helmer was engaged to be married, and he carried a photograph of his fiancée with him. He had the picture in his pocket when he made his way to his battery position here by the Ezer Canal, just a short distance from McRae's overworked field hospital. It was early in the morning of the 2nd of May, and Lex Helmer was about to die. The 2nd of May was a bad day. They were having heavy shelling that day. Um, by this time, the German airplanes had pinpointed their positions pretty well, even though they were quite well concealed, and they were getting a lot of very accurate artillery fire. Um, it, it appears that he was on his way to the guns. He received a direct hit from a shell, and as, you know, as is evident from something like that, there was little left of him. They had to collect bits of him because he, the shell was a big shell and it was a direct hit. So all that was left, you know, were small chunks of flesh. I think something like perhaps we see when car bombs have exploded directly underneath someone, someone in the modern world. So what they did was McRae supervised the picking up of the fragments of body and they were packed into a burlap um, sack which was shaped roughly into a human body shape and that was what was buried. There wasn't really enough to have a corpse as we would think of a corpse. Lieutenant Helmer was killed at the guns. He was a nice boy. His diary's last words were, it has quieted a little and I shall try to get a good sleep. His girl's picture had a hole right through it and we buried it with him. I said the committal service over him as well as I could for memory. A soldier's death. John McRae got no sleep the night he buried Lex Helmer. A wooden cross had been placed on his grave in the field behind the hospital, which had gradually become a cemetery. McRae could see the cross from where he sat on the step of an ambulance. He was seen by the other officers to be writing in his notebook, looking occasionally at the grave and at the poppies which had sprung up in the churned earth. John McRae was writing in Flanders Fields. Helmer's death acted as a catalyst. Um, it stood for the loss of so many young lives. Here was this young man, 22 years of age. he just graduated from McGill University. He had his whole life ahead of him. He was popular, well-liked. Um, John says when they buried him, he had a, his girlfriend's picture with him, which had a hole in it through it, so they buried that. So he, he'd had love in his life. Um, he, had, he, he was full of promise. Life could have been so full of promise. And here it was, all gone in a moment. And I think for him, it spoke of not just Helmer, but the so many thousands like him. Um, and that, I think, was the catalyst that, that moved him to write the poem. We are the dead. 
Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. John McRae's poem would give the poppy a whole new identity. By the early 1920s, it had become the international symbol of remembrance, and so it has remained. But there are other icons that emerged from the Second Battle of Ypres. As soon as the war was over, Flanders was being invaded all over again, this time by broken-hearted families anxious to see where and how their sons and husbands had died. Farmhouses along battlefields would be converted to trench cafes, where visitors could buy small meals and drinks and the souvenirs of war. Flower pots and vases made from artillery shells, clocks decorated with rounds of ammunition. There used to be hundreds of these cafes. This is now the only one left in Flanders. It has been a family business since 1918. For a few francs, you can visit the trenches, left untouched since the end of the war. These are the trenches where we lost a generation. After 17 days, the Second Battle of Ypres was over, and there was little either side had to show for it. No major ground had been lost or gained, no great victory or defeat. It was as if the whole thing had been for nothing. Yet, a hundred thousand soldiers had died. Two thousand Canadians had been killed in the first six days. John McRae was alive, but the carnage had left its mark. He was there for 17 days and nights, not taking his shoes off, not taking his clothes off, um, looking after the dreadfully wounded and so on. And that experience was just um, devastating to him. And after that, people said he, he changed. He, he, some nurses, who, or one nurse who saw him in Paris around, uh, shortly afterwards said just didn't recognize him. He seemed to age about 20 years. John McRae was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel and with some reluctance settled into a desk job at the new Number 3 General Hospital a few miles behind the lines near the town of Boulogne. The hospital was staffed by nurses and doctors from McGill University. Although they had the best possible training before they left Canada, nurse Claire Gass, who would later copy his poem in her daily journal, noted that nothing could have prepared them for what they would experience here. June 1st, 1915. Some of the new patients have dreadful, dreadful wounds. One young boy with his face shot away, both arms gone, and a great many wounds in both legs. Troops go through almost daily, and when we're able, we always wave strenuously at them. Poor lads, they seem so happy and full of life. There's a difference when they come back on the ambulance trains. Then they are silent. And so are we. The October entry in Claire Gass's diary shows that John McRae's poem was in circulation among the troops before it was officially published in Punch magazine on the 8th of December, 1915. So many of the other heroic poems of the First World War predict an outcome, demand an outcome, almost insist that we must win because if we don't win it's been a waste of time. In Flanders Field never says that, it says if. And to that extent, it keeps you in suspense. That war is still being fought for those dead people. And there's an incredibly clever element to it, which I don't think has been commented on very often before, which is that by holding the whole issue, the whole resolution of the war in suspension, he's actually freezing the mindset of the soldiers of whom he's writing. In other words, that poem is actually taking you inside the head of a soldier almost at the moment of death and leaving it open. And of course, to those people who died 1914 to 1918, they don't know who won the war. To that extent, it's remained an incredibly vibrant, incredibly alive poem. 
The poem was recited and discussed in the trenches of Flanders and all along the Western Front. It was a tremendous success, but did little to change the ongoing reality, for the war simply trudged on from week to week and now from year to year. By the end of 1917, the war devolved into shift work. Soldiers would be moved to the front on rotation. If they survived, they would be brought out for a short time until it was their turn again. Mail would be delivered, bodies removed, meals served, guns fired. Death had become a way of life. Violence and misery and killing had become a day job. Although not everyone shared the same work ethic. A lot of British soldiers, particularly British battalions, adopted a kind of live and let live view. When they went into the line, they wouldn't hurt the Germans, the Germans didn't hurt them, and that's how it kind of worked. But there were those nasty people up the line, Canadians, Australians, Scots, who didn't seem to understand this sensible arrangement. And who would, the bastards, fight, cause trouble, shell, patrol, and make trouble on a piece of line that otherwise had been perfectly peaceful. So when the, you know, the 32nd uh, Cornwall Light Infantry go back, they find instead of the comfy relationship with the, the Saxons on the other side, the other side is all stirred up and starts bombing and stonking and patrolling them. This isn't fair. And they got to fight back. But the Canadians felt they couldn't go home until the war was over. And the sooner it was over, the better. And that, I think, is what simply explains why some of them were more aggressive than others, and why the Canadians perhaps were more aggressive than other battalions. And, and it doesn't, it's no discredit to the 32nd Cornwall Light Infantry because on the whole, the British had lost far more men. They were more likely to be a battalion of men in their 30s and 40s than, than kids in their teens and 20s. And when you get to, as we both can testify, when you get to that age, your desire to kill or be killed diminishes substantially. You, you know, war should be fought by really old guys who the world could easily spare. But the trouble is they wouldn't fight. The success of In Flanders Fields had made John McRae famous. He could have returned to Canada and gone on the propaganda trail, raising money and the now flagging enthusiasm for the war. He could have transferred to a staff job in London and escaped the trenches completely. Instead, he stayed at the hospital. As the war made its way into the fall of 1917, it was noted that Colonel John McRae had become more remote, moody. He had started taking his horse Bonfire and his dog Bonneau for long, lonely rides into the French countryside. They put it down to fatigue. Early in January 1918, he complained of feeling sleepy and tired. He was taken to number 14 hospital, where British officers were treated, in the little French coastal town of Vimeru. He told his fellow doctors that he thought he had developed pneumonia. They found no evidence of it, but kept him in for observation. He slipped into a coma, and at half past one in the morning of January 28, 1918, John McRae, soldier, doctor, and poet, died. The post-mortem revealed that he had pneumonia in both lungs. The next day, his funeral procession made its way through the narrow streets of the French town to the cemetery on the hill. It was one of the best attended funerals of the war. It was certainly a mark of the esteem and the affection in which he was held. Um, it was held the day after his death. It was a lovely spring afternoon. Um, he was, because he died in number 14 British Hospital for Officers at Vimera, the nearest cemetery was Vimera Communal Cemetery. Um, it was actually um, a cemetery for the citizens of the town of Vimera, but um, it also had an area, um, it was on a hillside, a lovely hillside overlooking the sea, um, overlooking the English Channel. They had um, the nurses from number three, this was quite an unusual thing, but they um, got permission for them to attend and they wore their caps and, um, and uh, cloaks. His coffin was draped with the Union Jack because he died in a British hospital and not in a Canadian hospital. Um, they had a guard of honor um, and they had a contingent of the men from the hospital and from number 14. They had um, Bonfire, John McRae's horse with the um, traditional white ribbon 
which um, was they wore for funerals with his boots reversed in the stirrups. And it was a very, very moving funeral. Because he died so suddenly, there was great uh, sadness, great grief. It was obviously a very, very sad affair. was buried in the section of the cemetery the British reserved for their officers. His famous poem would be carved in stone near his grave. And later, in his honor, the town of Vimaru would name a street after him and misspell McRae. His personal effects and his medals were sent home to his mother in Guelph. Ray's achievements and life story would fade in the years following the First World War. They would be revived briefly in 1997, when his medals, which over the years had been forgotten and misplaced, were discovered by a Winnipeg coin dealer and suddenly came up for auction. It was known that an American collector would be bidding for them, but Toronto businessman Arthur Lee had also decided to drop by the auction house. I was minding my own business, everything was fine, and then about, I don't know, $270,000, $280,000, somewhere along that, um, the noise subsides quite substantially. And it was down to it about two bidders. So that's when I look up. And sure enough, right across the row from me, the first seat, first chair, there was this young man sitting there. And he was quite eager bidding. And before I realized it, the auctioneer had said, going once. And because there were so many items is up for auction, there was no going twice. After that, the hammer goes down, and that would be the end of the auction. So, and I look at the, uh, the young man, he's about 20 years old, and he doesn't look very Canadian to me. So I say, hmm, do I take a chance and let him take the medals and be gone with it? Or should I do something? So out of desperation, I just raised my arm. And then all of a sudden I was in the, in the bidding wall, and then um, it goes on for 15, 20 minutes at the end, uh, finally, I won out at $400,000. By the time the smoke cleared and the taxes and commission were added, the medals cost Mr. Lee $506,000. And then he donated them to the John McRae House in Guelph. We don't have very many Canadian heroes in Canada. And, and we kind of very quickly forgotten the ones that we do have. And I just want John McRae to be remembered. In Ypres, by the time the First World War ended, no buildings stood. The town square had been demolished, the cathedral, rubble and dust. Eventually, the returning townspeople would reclaim their history they would painstakingly rebuild, copying the detail from old maps and drawings and from the memories of the elderly. The ancient cloth hall is a replica. It was completed in 1968. Such was the devastation at Ypres that every night at 8 o'clock at the Menin Gate Memorial, the local fire department plays the last post, not just on November 11th, but every night of the year. Here are inscribed the names of the Allied soldiers whose bodies were never found, who might have been buried once, but then blown up again as the war continued. And among the 56,000 names is Lieutenant Alexis Helmer.
John McRae also gave his life for his country, for the war killed him as surely as it killed Lex Helmer. He too left no wife, no children, but he did leave his imprint in those remarkable words that have been carved in the heart and in the mind of all those who care about remembrance. Words that changed forever our view of that lost generation and changed until the end of time the way we look at that wild and tragic flower that once grew in Flanders Fields. <laughs>